Daisy. And I'm Terry. And this is the Monday, Monday Mindset, Mindset Podcast, Podcast, where we share things of interest to us and hopefully to you. So let's get started with episode number 101. 101. I never know which way to say it. Let's go with 101. <laughs> So this week, we are beginning a little bit of a series that Daisy and I have chosen to do, and we are going to share our takeaways from the book Atlas of the Heart by Brene Brown. The subtitle of that is Making Meaningful Connection and the Language of Human Experience. So you can imagine why we both really like this book. So Daisy, where are you going to get us started with this book? Well, where better to start than chapter one? <laughs> Excellent <laughs> which choice. Is, <laughs> which is entitled, Places We Go When Things Are Uncertain or Too Much. And as is always the case with Brene Brown, it's very, very content rich. So I have lots of notes and it's difficult to know when to stop, really. But let's get stuck in. So in this chapter, she is talking about stress, overwhelm, anxiety, worry, avoidance, excitement, dread, fear and vulnerability. And she starts with stress and overwhelm. And she talks a little bit about, very interesting actually, talks a little bit about some time she spent when she was at college working in uh, a very high pressure environment restaurant. And she uses stories from that to illustrate the difference between stress and overwhelm, which I thought was very useful. But uh, the typical definition of stress is when we evaluate environmental demand as beyond our ability to cope successfully. Words like unpredictability, uncontrollability and feeling overloaded. It can cause physiological, your body, and psychological, your mind and emotion reactions. And she says what's interesting is that the emotional reaction is more tied to our cognitive assessment of whether we can cope with the situation than how our body is reacting. And a little side note here, I really do recommend, as you will know, Terry and I really enjoy audiobook versions of books, but I think you're getting a lot extra in this case with the audiobook. She goes to great lengths and maybe she does with all her books. I don't know. I have to confess this is the first one I've read or listened to, but she is the narrator and she really thinks about the reader as she goes. So she often will repeat things. She'll say, yeah, you know, you've got to this point and if you were reading the book, you'd probably want to go and read that bit again or I feel this bit's really important so I'm going to go over it again so she'll you know she'll just do things like that for you there's an accompanying pdf which is images of course and she says you know I'm going to do things like describe these to you because you're probably in the middle of doing something when you're listening mm. to this so you're not going to want to stop and look at said accompanying pdf and she adds some extra anecdotes and things that aren't in the book. So you're getting a lot more, I think, for the um, a lot more sort of bang for your buck with the audio book, as well as listening to her. And she does read it in a really engaging and entertaining way. But then overwhelm is defined as being an extreme level of stress. It's emotional and or cognitive intensity to the point of feeling unable to function and where you're completely overcome or overpowered by thought or feeling. And she refers back to this time she spent working in the restaurant and they had these two terms. One was in the weeds and the other was blown. So you could come into the kitchen when you were working there and you could say that you were in the weeds. And, and this basically meant, and this is where she's relating it to the stress and the overwhelm, this basically equated to being stressed. You were too busy and stressed, but you could think through ways to manage it. So the question would be from the, uh, the, you know, the chef who was running the kitchen, what do you need? And someone would basically, you know, help you out. 
But when you're blown and you're overwhelmed, you basically reach this tipping point where you needed a time out. And that was the policy in the kitchen. The restaurant manager or the chef, whoever was the head of the kitchen, when you were in the weeds, he would intervene. When you were blown, there was no point. Everyone knew the kitchen went silent. Everyone stepped into action just like that. You had a time out and you went somewhere. And the understanding was you went somewhere for 10 minutes. You would come back after that 10 minutes and get back to it. But the point was here that there was no point asking you, what do you need? Because you wouldn't be able to give them the answer. It was just a cutoff. You go have a time out. We'll step in. We'll take over for 10 minutes. Get your head together. Come back. And I thought this was a really good way of illustrating the difference. When you have the ability to think through options and solutions, you might be in a very highly stressful environment, but you're not in overwhelm. Overwhelm is, I don't know, I can't think. You shut down, you can't function. And her takeaways, the things she repeated from this section was this point that your emotional reaction is more tied to your cognitive assessment of whether you can cope with the situation rather than how your body is reacting. She said she had always thought that it was a reaction to how she reacted to a situation physically, but this is not really the case. Your emotions respond more to thinking than your physical reaction. And she quoted John Kabat-Zinn, his definition of overwhelm is that it's the all too common feeling that our lives are somehow unfolding faster than the human nervous system and psyche are able to manage well. I quite like that. And she says that stress is part of your daily life, obviously, but high levels and chronic stress can really negatively impact your health. You know, as I'm listening to you, Daisy, I was first thinking, I know I love this listening to this book, but why is it that differentiating between these different reactions, these different emotions, why is that important? You know, is it just tomato, tomato, you say stress, I say overwhelm. But as I was listening to you describe it again, I was thinking stress can be a very positive thing. And one of the ways that we can best manage stress is to figure out what can we manage in this situation? What do we have control of? Where's our leverage in this situation? Whereas what you described when in the restaurant, when you're blown, when you're overwhelmed, you can't connect with what do I have control over? How can I salvage this? How can I use this opportunity? And so when we say to ourselves, I'm overwhelmed, I'm so overwhelmed, I'm so overwhelmed, I think we're kind of putting ourselves in that place where we don't feel that we have any way to manage it. And based on her description, that only happens sometimes. Mm. But stress happens regularly. And I think it would help us all to recognize stress is manageable. It does not have to be that negative, unhealthy thing that so many of us have learned it to be. It actually can be, it can prompt us to grow and to act and do things because we can focus on what can I do in this situation? But if we're describing it to ourselves as overwhelm, it's almost like we're abdicating. I have no control in this situation. Mm. So it's very exciting to get to hear you recapping it because it reminds me, is this just Terry enjoying listening to talk about emotions? No, it's actually helpful to differentiate what these different emotional responses mean. So carry on, Daisy. <laughs> <laughs> well, in something she, she does sort of come back to towards the end of the chapter is talking about, and it's one of the key concepts of the book, that language is important and the words that you use, and also figuring out these different emotions and sitting with them and identifying them. I mean, we've, we've spoken about this before. How can you figure out a solution until you've identified what the problem is? Mm -hmm. And so I think it 
it is kind of important. Yes, you know, that these labels are important. And like you say, because there are certain connotations that you will subconsciously, subliminally, whichever the appropriate word is, have with these words. Like you say, there's this, there's almost this abdication of responsibility with overwhelm. And so identifying that difference, but also the importance of knowing when you are overwhelmed. Because there's no point, especially if you're somebody, I guess, who's used to dealing with stress, used to dealing with high, highly stressful situations. And so, you know, you are that person who does come up with a solution. You're used to having to come up with solutions. It is going to be important to know when you've reached that tipping point of overwhelm and actually you need that time out and you don't need people saying to you, how can I help? Mm -hmm. because you don't know. And that's something that she says, you know, ask yourself, am I coping? Can I handle this? If you can basically, if you can think of a solution, if you can think of a way out, it's more stress than it is overwhelm. But that's not to say that chronic stress doesn't have a problematic impact. It also reminds me of a concept. I don't think she talked about this in that chapter, but Couples therapists and couples experts, um, the Gottmans, write about when you're having a disagreement with your spouse or partner, if one of them, one of you is flooded with emotion, there's no ability to go on in a productive Mm. way. Yeah. Because that's overwhelming. Same principle, isn't it? And so it's important to be able to recognize that I need to stop here. Mm. I am so flooded. I'm overwhelmed. Us processing this more is only going to make things worse and I'm going to get more flooded. So we need to pause here. Mm. So I think this concept is really important to know the difference between I'm stressed and I can handle it. I can find ways to manage it versus I can't even be in that mindset to think of anything that could get me through this right now. I just need to tread water. Mm. And I guess having, particularly if it's in the context of other people being involved, is to maybe, you know, have it be known. If if you're somebody who this happens to, you know, a really busy mum, for example, that, you know, when I say time out and I go to my room for half an hour, it just I just need to be left alone mm-hmm. and then I'll get everything together and I'll be back to it. You know, so it's it's figuring out the differences and potentially having some strategies to deal with that. So then she goes on to uh, another biggie, anxiety. And as usual, she has a great way of describing it. And she calls it the Willy Wonka shit tunnel. (laughs) So anyone who's watched the original, the Gene Wilder original, it's that when they go on that boat ride down through the tunnel and it starts off all nice and happy and then everything goes a bit sideways and they start having all these really scary images and things. It's basically... um, an escalating scene of fear and loss of control, as she describes it. There's no real narrative sense. It's just scary and confusing. And anxiety feels like an escalating loss of control. Worst case scenario thinking and imagery and total uncertainty. And she says, you know, you need something to keep you afloat when you jump off the boat before it heads into the shit tunnel. (laughs) You need a life jacket. And she quotes Elizabeth Gilbert, who says, you are afraid of surrender because you don't want to lose control, but you never had control. All you had was anxiety. And she defines anxiety as, I can't remember which dictionary, An emotion characterized by feelings of tension, worried thoughts, and physical changes like increased blood pressure. And she she goes on because these are these are terms that she's going to use repeatedly in the book, but she says anxiety can be both a state and or a trait. And she just defines these because as I say, she's she's going to keep referring to them. But a trait is part of your personality. It tends to be a long-term characteristic that shows through your behavior, actions, feelings. Example, I am an anxious person. It's part of your identity. 
Whereas a state is a temporary condition that you experience. And it's a state that passes and you return to another condition. Example, I'm feeling anxious about doing something. And she says it can be difficult, though, to distinguish between the two. And anxiety is one of these things that can be both a state and a trait. So the difference is that you're anxious in response to a certain situation, state, versus having a natural disposition towards anxiety, where it's more of a trait. Let's just talk a little bit about generalized anxiety disorder being different from them both and that you really basically need professional help to deal with that. But less than 50% of people apparently who have it seek professional help. But she talks about how she's gone to therapy and it's really helped her to develop strategies to help deal with her reaction to things. And she also mentioned caffeine, which I'm terribly worried that it's something that I've got to consider too. Um, sleep and exercise are all things she's had to address to help with her anxiety. But the big word that comes up with anxiety is uncertainty. And she said that the less comfortable you are with uncertainty, the more you, likely you are to experience anxiety as both a state and a trait. And anxiety tends to lead to worry or avoidance as coping strategies, but neither of these are helpful. When we worry, this is the thinking part of anxiety. It's not really an emotion. It's a chain of negative thoughts about bad things that might happen in the future. And apparently research has shown that people who tend to worry believe that it's a helpful coping strategy, although it isn't. You tend to feel it's uncontrollable, so you don't try and stop it. They also tend to try and suppress it, which only strengthens us to worry more. And the other one, of course, is avoidance. And we tend to spend time avoiding the thing that feels overwhelming. But this can really be hurtful not only to ourselves, but to other people. And it tends to lead to increased anxiety. And she quotes Harriet Lerner, it is not fear that stops you from doing the brave and true thing in your daily life. Rather, the problem is avoidance. You want to feel comfortable so you avoid doing or saying the thing that will evoke fear and other difficult emotions. Avoidance will make you feel less vulnerable in the short run, but it will never make you feel less afraid. Um, but we're back again now to language being really important because she then goes on to talk about the difference between anxiety and excitement. And she says, actually, these two states feel very, very similar, but it's how we interpret and label them that can determine how we experience them. You know, excitement is defined as an energized state of enthusiasm leading up to or during an enjoyable activity. But she said she makes the point that it doesn't always feel that good. So they're very similar feelings. They can be very similar feelings to being anxious. But anxiety is the negative perception of those feelings. And excitement is the positive perception. So she says, you know, sometimes take a deep breath and see actually if you can label it differently, what you're feeling. Because if you can interpret those bodily sensations in more of a positive rather than a negative way, it can be really helpful to our mindset. I'm sure that's a little bit a case of it's easier said than done though. But I can see some situations where the two could get confused. And if you took a moment and took a breath, you could steer much more towards this is an excitement feeling rather than anxiety. And I think even just using the word for yourself to say, I'm currently in an excited state because of the uncertainty of what I'm going into. That's different than saying I'm anxious about it. I'm in an excited state because there's uncertainty. Mm. Just like I'm in an excited state because I'm about to go, you know, on this great 
or to this great concert. That's an excited feeling. And if we can start labeling it that way in these uncertain situations, we can feel it less negatively. Because again, that thought will trigger mm. even more of a physical response. I thought it was an interesting concept though, because I mean, when you think about it, they do feel very, very similar. Mm -hmm. Very, very similar, that sort of creepy, crawly, um, under your, your skin feeling. It reminds me very much of Kelly McGonigal's thoughts about movement and how you can take the same situation and view it in different ways. You can view getting out of breath and perhaps struggling to get enough air in, sweating and, you know, feeling overexerted. Well, there are two pretty distinct ways of viewing that. You know, you can focus on, I can't get enough air in. Gosh, I feel really tired. I feel, you know, this is too much. It feels a bit overwhelming. Um, or, gosh, yes, you know, I can feel the energy pulsing through my body. This is exciting. This is, yeah, I feel out a bit out of breath, but I feel good because I'm pushing myself. Same situation, different um, different thoughts going through your head. She goes on to a term which I've used a lot in association with depression, and that is dread. Although the way she's using it is, well, it's different, I guess, but I guess the feeling, that feeling of dread is the same. She says it occurs in response to high probability of negative events and the magnitude increases as the dreaded events draws nearer. She uses the example of going to the dentist uh, which I'm sure a lot of us can conjure very, very easily. But the problem with it is it makes that anticipated negative event worse. And she says it often leads to you wanting to get it over and done with earlier than the event in question is, even if the earlier experience will be worse because avoiding that period of dread is is preferable. And she said, you know, dread is exhausting. When she, when she talked about going to the dentist, she would, the dentist would say to her, well, that wasn't as bad as you were thinking it would be, was it? And she was saying no, but she still feels exhausted because of that buildup of dread. Anxiety and dread, the threat is in the future. And then she goes on to talk about fear. With fear, the threat is now in the present. It's, it's a negative, short-lasting, high alert emotion in response to a perceived threat. And it's another one that can be a state or a trait. It arises when we need to respond quickly to a physical or psychological danger that is present and imminent. It's a rapid fire emotion. And the reaction can happen before we realize we're afraid. Fight, flight freeze. It's very instinctive. But she says one of the biggest one when they ask people to give examples of fear, one that comes up on every list is uh, fear of social rejection. And the potential exposure to this drives fear. And that, as we know, can come up with really little things. So this is actually something that can come up a lot. Um, but she does say, and we've, we've spoken about this before, that anxiety and fear from an evolutionary point of view can be very helpful. And this is where she starts wrapping it back round. And it's, it's what you mentioned about understanding and respecting these emotions and maybe even learn to befriend some of them. You know, she suggests sitting with them and understanding why they're showing up. And I'd made a note here that I mentioned earlier that, you know, you need to actually identify what's going on before you can start to do something about it. But, you know, the big thing for her, she was saying, is, is what can we learn from them? And then she wraps it all up with vulnerability. And this is uh, traditionally often seen as being weak. But she says, you know, that's a big and common misconception. She says there's no courage without vulnerability and vulnerability may be uncomfortable and difficult at times but it's certainly not a lack of strength it's a willingness to lean into uncertainty risk and emotional exposure 
And embracing vulnerability is the key to success with leadership. And, you know, she does a lot of work, doesn't she, with companies about this. There's this need to be able to handle uncertainty, risk and emotional exposure in ways that align with your values. And I guess that's that's how it wraps back round this. I got the sense anyway that vulnerability, not exactly an antidote to the other things, but this willingness to lean into uncertainty. Uncertainty came up as the big key word around anxiety, for example. So this, where she wraps it up with needing to understand and respect these emotions, to sit with them, what can we learn from them, lean into some of them and you know, how can we move out from that, grow with them, I guess. And I think it all wraps back in, like you said, because I think it's that sense of vulnerability that really underlies a lot of those emotions, the fear, the worry, the anxiety, because it's it's uncomfortable usually to to experience vulnerability. And so we do a lot of things to thwart it, to avoid it, to get away from it. And I think the more that we can learn to trust ourselves with sitting with our emotions, being in that vulnerability and seeing the growth and opportunity that comes from getting through the vulnerability, then we can have less fear, less anxiety, less overwhelm because we trust ourselves and know that it's going to be okay. We're going to get through these challenging emotions. Yes, it very much ties into one of your favorite subjects, doesn't it? The growth versus the fixed mindset. In fact, I've just been watching you talk about that with some editing. I've been <laughs> As you've been editing. <laughs> <laughs> but it ties very nicely into it. There's just this, and again, it's that word, that, that potential expansiveness, isn't it? It's just you know, instead of being closed, instead of using things like worry and avoidance that just shuts you down and doesn't actually, as, as she said, we use them as coping strategies, but they're very, very ineffective. But really, they're mostly avoidance strategies, yeah. unfortunately, and that just keeps us away from that growth and, and development. Yeah. And it just kind of has a slow build underneath. That's right. So Daisy, I think you've started us off so well with this book. It is an amazing book and each chapter has many layers that you can dig through. And so you've really, I think, set us up well for how this book goes and some important concepts to be thinking about as we progress. Yes, I think that's the key with her writings. It doesn't necessarily, maybe she does a bit later, but it doesn't necessarily give you answers and solutions, but just lots of things to think about and explore. And, you know, that's the first stage in the process of potentially finding some strategies and things to help. So maybe you've been listening along at home yourself and can join in with thinking about this this great book from Brene Brown. But we'll be back next week with whatever Terry decides to share. So I shall look forward to that. In the meantime, have a great week. And perhaps it'll be chapter two. <laughs> <laughs> have a great week, everybody. Bye-bye.